Good, uh, good afternoon, my friends. It's a little afternoon in the west coast of the United States, in California. And I'm continuing our uh, engagement, the daily engagement that we have here in the space during the um, sheltering that we're all experiencing, the uh, very wise and self-imposed hopefully, um, seclusion, physical distancing during the pandemic, giving us an opportunity to reboot, to reset, to re-engage. As you know, the news is a little bit uh, frightening uh, in the sense that uh, there is a pandemic of fear and stress and uh, panic uh, across the world and uh, I want to share with you that uh, whilst it's very important to be informed and practice the best physical and mental hygiene possible and we are being given advice on this from all over the world um, while it's important to do that it is also a time to reflect on the deeper significance of what is going on. And I think if we reflect on the deeper significance of what is going on, then um, we have the opportunity to um, use this perceived adversity and real adversity um, as a launching pad for a new humanity. So uh, that's what I want to talk about uh, today, if that's all right. I took a week of silence for many reasons. Uh, one was that I was kind of, uh, um, in a sense, uh, feeling that uh, there was no need for me to participate <clears throat> in the recycling of uh, good information that is helpful for all of us but also there was no need for me to participate in the recycling of the collective panic and also uh, it's a fact that every year i've taken a week of silence anyway with uh, uh, a few people and that's been very helpful to me for regenerating my body reinventing my body, resurrecting my soul, and all of that. So this was an opportunity for me to engage once again in a week of silence. I have a practice of doing daily meditation, about 35 uh, yogasanas, yogic uh, uh, postures, or yogasanas, seats of awareness, along with pranayam, deep breathing, and uh, I also have a practice of meditation <clears throat> that is anywhere from one hour to two to three hours. So in this week of silence, I also added one additional element to my daily practice at night. So at night, before I go to sleep, I do a little bit of meditation. Then I do a little bit of uh, mindful awareness uh, of perceptions and then I do something called yoga nidra and then I slip into deep sleep as, um, as a ritual every night. <clears throat> so this week I also decided to add to my ritual a practice of inquiry which means uh, going into deep stillness and uh, asking questions uh, of my higher self or you might say the spirit or non-local reality or the divine infinite being not only to ask questions but also to um, dive deeply into the nature of experience so one of the things I was doing and I'm now continuing to do as part of my nightly ritual is that I am um, recalling, recapitulating moments of my life from 
the earliest childhood memories to now, randomly. So, you know, as I do that randomly, I see images, I feel sensations, I feel thoughts, I feel emotions of times gone by. I remember being 10 years of age and talking to my friend Timur Hamid, who was the grandson of the then king of Afghanistan. I remember playing cricket with my brother and my father in the um, yard in our house, on and on. And one of the things that happened as I was uh, recapitulating <clears throat> and uh, in this process of deep inquiry, I was uh, also amazed by the fact that uh, I could not relate to some of the characters that uh, I knew then, including myself. You know, I could not relate to that 10-year-old boy, you know, or to the 17-year-old medical student sitting next to uh, a colleague of mine, a medical student, who was a lovely uh, person, but uh, smelt of formalin as I did, because we were both dissecting dead bodies. I recalled all these people and I wondered where were they, where, were that, where was that boy, Deepak, when he was uh, talking to his friend Timur Hamid from Afghanistan or playing cricket with his brother and father. Who was that? Because that person doesn't exist anymore. That character doesn't exist. Not the same mind, not the same uh, body, not the same personality. So who's that? And uh, it was very clear to me that every identity that we have as a person is provisional, is transforming, and is entangled, entangled, uh, which means connected and inseparable uh, from collective experience. So my mind is entangled right now with yours. We are sharing mind. You're giving me feedback. I'm looking at it and I'm speaking to you. Our minds are entangled. But because our minds are entangled, our bodies are entangled. Our brains are entangled. And that means our neural activity is entangled. It also means that our genetic activity is entangled because gene activity is influenced by experience, <clears throat> mental experience, physical experience, it's all one. And so we are entangled as minds, we are entangled as bodies, and we are entangled as ultimate destiny because we have the same source. Okay, Think of your body as having its source in a pluripotential stem cell, one fertilized ovum that differentiates into all the organs in your body, all the organs in your body, eyes and nose and fingernails and hair follicles and genitalia and genes and brain, one cell differentiates into all of that. So the cells in your body are entangled with all the other cells in your body in that they're all serving one holistic function called self-regulation, homeostasis. So are the organs, your heart, and your brain, and your kidney, and your stomach, and your digestive processes, and your immune system, and your endocrine system, and um, your emotions, your sensations, your images, your feelings, your thoughts, all entangled within the biological organism, but also with other biological organisms, with me, with you, and everyone else that we know at a deeper level. Now, in physics, in fundamental quantum physics, mathematically, this is known as quantum entanglement at the level of particles, described in a famous equation of Einstein called the einstein podolsky rosen equation, and ultimately um, by experiments also, quantum entanglement has been established uh, through 
experiments, Alain Aspect and many other people, Bell's theorem, all point to a very fundamental fact of existence, which is at the level of um, particles and waves of possibility, everything is entangled with everything in the entire universe. Doesn't matter uh, where in the universe. Across the fabric of space-time, particles are entangled, which means the activity of one particle is influencing all other particles and all other particles are influencing the activity of every other particle. And this is instantaneous. This is without mitigation. Um, this is unmediated. There's no medium of exchange. It is unmitigated. The robustness of the entanglement doesn't diminish with distance in space and time. And it's instantaneous. <clears throat> right now, our entanglement is almost instantaneous. In any case, that's at the level of particles, but it's also at the level of molecules, it's at the level of organs, it's at the level of our biological organism, it is at the level of the ecosystem, it is at the level of um, life, of existence, at the level of all sentient beings. And what is that? Entanglement. In physics, sometimes people use um, the expression a causal, without cause, non-local, outside of space-time, quantum mechanical, at a very fundamental level, interrelatedness, interrelatedness, interconnectedness. A causal, non-local, quantum mechanical, interrelatedness. We can also call it synchronicity. Um, the entanglement of fundamental reality with everything else. But that entanglement is also present at the level of our body, the level of our mind, the level of our body, the level of our ecosystem, and um, the level of our personal relationships, the level of our professional interactions, and the level of our business and financial interactions, the level of, um, of everything in the universe is entangled with everything else in the universe. Our minds are aspects of a deeper one mind. Our bodies are aspects or activities of a deeper body, the universe. And our emotions are entangled with each other. And um, so is every experience, every sensation, every perception, every thought, every feeling, every emotion, uh, every image that happens in our mind, uh, that they're all entangled with each other and with each of us and with the entire ecosystem of relationships. So this is nothing new, okay? Thich Nhat Hanh, the great Buddhist uh, teacher says we are inter-beings that inter-arise in the inter and, uh, The Buddha famously said that all suffering comes from the illusion of the separate self. And of course that is also the one principle of Vedanta which um, says that um, uh, the causes of suffering are tied to not knowing fundamental reality which is the entangled self which is part of the infinite entangled being or the infinite being that expresses itself through infinite correlation and entanglement of all sentient beings and their universes and their experiences. And so that's a very um, famous, um, not only Buddhist principle, but also the principle of Vedanta. Synchronicity is also part of that. And so we are finding new terms to share this today. But our minds are entangled, our bodies are entangled, and our destiny is entangled. So what has all this to do with the coronavirus? Well, you know, if you think of it in a deep level, 
then viruses, bacteria, plants, animals, ecosystems, biosphere, they're all entangled. Okay, so viruses and bacteria and plants are in many ways our biological ancestors. And uh, viral um, um, dissemination across the world is actually the entanglement of, uh, of genetic information. And one of the reasons that um, this COVID-19 is so devastating is that uh, it seems to be a new virus, it's called the novel virus, but it may in fact uh, not be a novel virus. It must may in fact be a variation, a genetic variation of coronaviruses that have existed all along and therefore it has been in the ecosystem um, either uh, as a manifest uh, virus that we are calling COVID-19 at the moment or as a potential mutation that has existed in the ecosystem all along. So COVID is not inside you or outside you. COVID is inside you and me and in between and everywhere. And because of our current acceleration of entanglement with uh, transport systems, air travel, um, and mass migrations, uh, and um, connectivity at every level, connectivity of uh, uh, products, of goods, of services, of um, food, of everything, um, the, this entanglement is becoming more obvious. The virus is spreading very fast. Um, when I was um, a child, and you know, this is part of my recapitulation, um, you know, I hadn't been on a plane till after medical school. The first time I took a plane was when I came to the United States on a Pan Am flight. And I'd actually not even uh, seen a, a transport plane of that size, a jumbo jet. I had not seen television. Uh, I was familiar with the telephone, but I didn't have one. And so I was happy. I used to read, I used to write, I used to play with my friends, see an occasional movie, and totally happy. I was actually, now I realize, in, in um, physical social distancing as we know it now. And I was totally happy. And, uh, and then I got used to everything that we have created, and then uh, got entangled in it. And now we are, uh, of course, experiencing this entangled, accelerated as a pandemic. But even as we are imposing our self-imposed, hopefully, um, um, distancing, physical distancing, um, what we're seeing across the world is clearer skies. We are seeing uh, birds singing in places like uh, Bangalore, which are very congested. We are seeing uh, fish returning to fresh, fresher streams and lakes. And the air is better. Some asthmatics are breathing better. And uh, um, in general, the imposed um, self um, physical isolation is projecting itself as a, a cleaner world. So we are recognizing that uh, climate change is also part of the entanglement of our existence and linked to the entanglement of our collective behavior. So it is linked to our collective behavior. And um, that behavior is being forced to change in a way. Uh, the stock market is crashing, which means um, even our financial fortunes are entangled. So they're entangled. Uh, and uh, if we think some of us are suffering, then there are innumerable people that are suffering more than us at this moment. So, um, 
the COVID uh, pandemic doesn't matter. It originated in a bat or maybe was a uh, mutation in a lab. It doesn't matter. Its potential was there because it existed as a variant of existence, as a variation, varied form of existence in the ecosystem of existence. So what is coming out of this? What is coming out of this is our opportunity to realize that all our suffering comes from um, the fear that is generated in the idea of the separate ego self. That is the basic problem, fear. And fear comes from not knowing that we are part of everything, the magnificence of existence. In fact, we, our consciousness, is part of the infinite consciousness that projects itself as the universe, Brahman, Brahman. That's the ultimate reality of non-local entanglement. But even at the level of local experience, there is entanglement all the way, all the way. So right now, what can we do to use this um, uh, pandemic um, experience as um, an opportunity to create a better world, to create a more peaceful, just, sustainable, healthier, and joyful world. Will we come out renewed? Will we come out having renewed our collective body? Our collective body is the biosphere. Will we come out renewed in our collective mind with more empathy, more compassion, more joy, more equanimity, more creativity, and uh, more love in action. And will we resurrect our soul so that we can feel one with the source of the universe? This is our opportunity today. So I know as I watch the news that there are many organizations already that are shifting to a new way of doing business and of, um, of being engaged in the world. I'm seeing many nonprofits, including, you know, I was yesterday watching CNN and CNN.com uh, slash impact is a nonprofit website for you to engage in any way that you want to, to help alleviate the suffering of the world. But there are many other organizations and you can choose one, including um, um, services coming from the United Nations, from the WHO, from many nonprofits across the world. And um, the Chopra Foundation is putting together all the research that shows the connection between inflammation, self um, regulation, healing, and um, immunity. And you can find this information, by the way, to, by going to ChopraFoundation.org. Once again, you can get all the information that you want by going to ChopraFoundation.org and see how you can also participate. And whilst the enemy is, uh, um, enemy is being perceived as the COVID virus, it's actually the enemy is the separate self. The enemy is our own separate self in a different uniform. This is the time for us to get rid of the word enemy. Even the COVID virus is not an enemy. There is no need for war. We have enough of that. War on everything from poverty to AIDS and now to coronavirus. The war on um, social injustice, the war on economic injustice, the war for climate change, the war on war, the war on terrorism. Let's get rid of these metaphors. Uh, there's us. 
and the world that we experience every day is the projection of the entangled collective mind. And if that entangled collective mind realizes the futility of selfishness, then of course whatever happens ultimately will be um, something that we have participated in creating. We have participated in creating today's ecosystem of social injustice, economic injustice, climate change, war, tribalism, extreme nationalism, uh, ethnocentrism, bigotry, hatred, prejudice. All of this is a projection of our collective separate self. But once we understand that that is the illusion, then we can participate in correcting that illusion and actually project the universe that we want to experience, not only for ourselves, but for each other and for all sentient beings. Because that's what the universe is. It's a projection of the entanglement of sentient beings and the biosphere that we call the world. This is our opportunity. And for this, there is a sacrifice that we need to make right now. Get rid of every selfish concern. Remember that every time you uh, feel um, anxious, fearful, uh, stressed, ask yourself, who am I thinking about? And you will be mostly thinking about yourself. And the moment you shift your awareness to the collective entangled self, there is peace, there is joy, and there is contentment, there is grace, there is insight, there is intuition, there is a new imagination, a new creativity, and a new emergence. That's what we need now, a new emergence. Forget about all enemies, political, national, uh, other races, we're all part of the infinite being differentiating itself with maximum diversity for our collective well-being. Let us not interfere with that. Let us rest in this domain of infinite uh, awareness and all we have to sacrifice is our ego identity, which is a socially induced hallucination to begin with. Debra asks, is capitalism hurting the world and majority in it? You know, you can ask that of any institutional creation or ideology. Capitalism, communism, socialism, extreme nationalism, um, or anything else. The systems that got created were actually uh, created with uh, an idea, the American dream, so on. But the dream has of course become a nightmare. So it's not the fault of systems, whether it's capitalism or communism or democracy or whatever. Uh, it's, um, the problem is the separate self. And we can take any system and use it to enhance the well-being of the world and we can take any system and also use it to destroy the well-being of the world. I think at this moment, forget all systems uh, as they have been projected because what they're showing us right now, the stock market, what's happening in the world, is showing us the fragility, the fragility and the weakness of a world culture that is based on an illusion. And what is that illusion? The separate self. Right now, all we need to ask is, how can I help? 
if we ask that one question and we engage with each other. There will be new economies. People in Bangladesh will be having a job in Chicago through new technologies, the internet, through digital technologies. I'm finding now the creativity to expand my uh, courses uh, through digital uh, master classes. Uh, Para Shakti Iyer says, how can you dismiss coronavirus? It kills people. No, we should not dismiss anything. In fact, um, uh, I have a great respect right now for um, coronavirus. Um, it is outsmarting the intelligence of humans and all it is is a bit of genetic information, part of the ecosystem of existence. I respect everybody because life is sacred and this pandemic is reminding us of the sacredness of all existence. Only one question, how can I help? And um, you can help by engaging uh, right now uh, through technology if you want, um, in the ecosystem of well-being through relationship, attention, deep listening, affection, deep caring, appreciation, noticing the gift that everyone brings to the world and acceptance of what is right now. What is right now, you have to accept. What could be, we can change. Every decision we make, every choice we make, at this moment, creates the future. Thank you and God bless.